Okay, so again, um, good morning and for today, uh, I will be discussing on the spirochetes. Okay, so when you say spirochetes, um, this particular group of bacteria is actually very unique because of their shape. So if you will notice, um, they are highly spiral in shape. So these organisms are spiral in shape. So let us now discuss um, one some of the most important features of pyrochetes. So they are helical, slender, and motile organisms. So the motility of the spirochetes is sometimes um, described as or screw motility. So they are described as corkscrew motility and they are long because they could reach as long as 20 microns in length and their width is between 0.1 to 300 microns or that's between uh that is up to the maximum of 300 nanometer okay so that's the characteristic of these spirochetes. So they possess one or more complete turn in the helix. Okay, so they are flexible and with several fibril. Okay, so in fact, um, they are termed as periplasmic flagella. So if we're going to look at this particular spirochete, okay, take a look at this organism. Okay, so actually, um, they have a flagella here that would actually um, expand and go to the other side. So this particular flagella here is the periplastic flagella or sometimes um, they are known as the endoflagellum. And this particular endoflagellum is also known as the eggshell filament. And that is responsible for the corkscrew motility. So if ever you have already experienced opening wine bottle using a corkscrew, okay, so that's how we describe the motility of the spirochetes. So the metabolism is species dependent. Um, some of them would even be requiring rabbit serum for cultivation. And they use carbohydrates, amino acids, or long chains of fatty acid alcohol as sources of carbon and energy. So that's the reason why um, these particular spirochetes are sometimes difficult to cultivate. So for example, um, for Treponema pallidum, the causative agent of syphilis, sometimes they are being they are being cultivated using the testicular, the testicle of a rabbit. Okay, so so they can go as far as going to rabbit cultivation. But later on, we will be discussing, it depends on the species, on how are we going to cultivate these particular spirochetes. So there are three main um, classifications. So the order is called spirochetales, and the families are leptospirosy and spirochetacy. And there are three medically important genera, and these are the treponema, and then we have the borrelia, and then we have the leptospira. Okay, so the leptospira, uh, the, the electron micrograph that we can show here is an example of leptospira interrogans. So the reason why we call it interrogans because it appears like um, a question mark, diba? So, ang kulang lang yung tuldo. Okay. But, they are called leptospira interrogans. Okay. So, so, this one is an example of that. Okay. And, clinical significance, are they clinically significant? Yes. Because, um, this particular um, different species of, of spirochetales can cause sexually transmitted syphilis, such as treponema pallidum, zoonosis, Lyme disease, and even relapsing fever. So we will be discussing each genus one by one, and we will try to, <clears throat> we will actually study 
the different um, pathologic features of each bacteria. Okay, so Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum, for example, is the causative agent of syphilis. And then there are other subspecies that may cause yaws and pinta. And we do also have Borrelia, which may cause relapsing fever and Lyme disease. So there are actually two important species in Borrelia. Uh, Borrelia recurrentis, which may cause relapsing fever. And the other one is Borrelia burgdorferi, which may cause Lyme disease. And then um, Leptospira, um, ito common tuwing may baha, which can cause leptospirosis. And Spirula minor, which can cause rat bite fever. Okay, so these are the different causative agents of clinical infections of the different spirocutales. Okay, so let's discuss first, the first in our list, the leptospires. Okay, so this is an example of the electron micrograph of leptospire interrogants. So, para talaga siyang question mark, kaya siya tinawag na interrogants from the word interrogate. So, they are ob obligate aerobic helical rod that measures between 0.1 micron by 10 to 15 micron. So which means that the maximum length is as much as 15 micron. They are tightly coiled, tightly coiled, okay, thin and flexible. They may appear to be a chain of cocci. So akala mo cocci talaga siya, but kung titignan nyo closely, hindi siya cocci. Kasi nga, Ano siya, sobrang tightly coiled. Okay, so so they are tightly coiled. Hindi katulad ng iba na yung, tight, yung coil niya pag ganito. But kung titignan nyo yung coil ng leptospires, they are tightly coiled. So one, one or both ends have hooks rather than tapering off. So ito yung hook. So hindi sila nag-taper off. Okay? Motion is rapid, translational, and rotational. So historically, there are over 200 different zero variety of Leptospira, but the one that we will be discussing for today's lecture um, shall be Leptospira interrogans sensulato. Okay, so um, that would be the, uh, that one is actually um, very significant. Okay, the sensulato. So actually, in taxonomy, when you say sensulato, sensulato is in the broad sense. Okay, so that that's what we meant by sensulato. So ang ibig sabihin, including all its subordinate taxa or other times considered as and other taxa. Okay, kaya nga siya, kaya siya ginamit na, word na, sensulato. So, used especially with names of Ataxa to indicate that the name is used more exclusively, inclusively, that sanctioned by current practice. So, talagang pag sinabi natin sensulato, there are other taxa that may be actually part of this particular organism. At any rate, um, they are obligate aerobic and can grow in artificial medium. So the one that we're listing here, here is an example of a Fletcher medium. So it's a semi-solid medium. Pag sinabi natin semi-solid, it's not pure liquid and it's not pure solid. And then the Stuart liquid medium. So the Stuart liquid medium is actually an example of a broth. And then we also have the Ellinghausen Macul Jensen Harris EMJH semi solid medium. Okay, so these are these are the these are the um first of all culture media that we can use for its, its study. Okay, so how would you know if there are, if there's a growth? So usually you would take note that there is a 
um, turbidity. So, pag nagkaroon ng turbidity, okay, so that's how we determine that the growth is already positive. Okay? So, virulence factor, ano, but may include um, reduced phagocytosis, soluble hemolysin, and even endotoxins. Okay. So, if we're going to look at the life cycle, so organisms contaminate mud or water. Kaya nga, ang leptospira is common sa mga rice paddy, sa rice field, or even in flood water. So, bakit napupunta sa mud? It's because um, these organisms are being shed in the urine of infected animals. Okay? And this particular bacteria will enter will enter the human body through break in the skin or intact mucosa and the initial, initial site of multiplications are unknown so ano ba yung mga ano ba yung mga uh, mammals that may contain leptospira so predominantly found in rats but other wild mammals may also carry the organism. So whenever these wild mammals and rodents um, urinate, urinate, for example, they urinate in garbage, and then during flood, flood, so the bacteria in the garbage will go into the flood water, and humans, particularly in Metro Manila, we used to wade in flood water. So if we have open wounds, bacteria will actually enter our skin, okay? Through breaks in our skin, kung may mga sugat tayo. So that is the reason why it is being discouraged that we actually wade into flood water because of the risk of getting leptospira, okay? So aside from wading into a flood water, so these are the common risk factors. So planting particularly in the rice field kasi di ba sa pag nag pag nagtatanim tayo ng palay naka-immerse yung ating mga paa so dapat naka-boots daw dapat para hindi mo contaminate yung paa okay hunting gutting okay so pag nagkakatay ka okay canoeing weaving skinning fishing bearing in contaminated water Harvesting ng palay, for example, butchering, clamming, and swimming. So these are the risk factors for getting um, the organisms. So let's talk about the clinical infections. So the incubation period of leptospirosis ranges from 3 to 30 days. So usually um, with the average of 10 to 12 days. So kung nabalitaan ninyo, in 2009, um, there was this greatest flood seen in almost all of the Metro Manila, that is the Ondoy, lalo na sa Marikina. So at the onset of that flood, marami namatay. But after the flood, marami pa rin namatay due to leptospirosis. So the initial phase comes on abruptly. So it is characterized by fever, headache, malay, and severe myalgia. And then subsequent phase, is actually more severe because it will now involve your liver, your kidneys, and even your central nervous system. So it, so there is a hepatic, renal, and CNS involvement. So in the liver, there is a characteristic of renal lesions. Okay, renal lesions are interstitial nephritis with glomerular swelling and hyperplasia. So, conjunctival suffusion is seen in less than half. So, sa mata yun. So, illness would last from one week up to three weeks. So, bakit nakakamatay siya? Because of the possibility of renal failure. In fact, leptospirosis is also known as the Wills disease. Okay? So, pag meron kayong narinig na word na Wheel disease, so that is also related to leptospirosis. Okay, so 
late manifestation is caused by host immunologic response. So, ano ba yung ibig sabihin ng wheel disease? The one that I've mentioned. It means that if it's already a wheel disease, wheel disease is a severe form of leptospirosis. So, it is a severe form of leptospirosis characterized by jaundice. So, pag sinabi natin jaundice, there is already a yellow discoloration of the skin and the sclera of the eyes. And ang fatal dito is renal failure, hepatic failure, and intravascular disease. So, makakakita na kayo ng petechiae. Okay? And this one can really be fatal. Okay? So, yung intravascular disease is known as the DIC. So, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And so, that's the reason why um, leptospirosis can really be fatal. So, it is a zoonotic disease, meaning to say it is primarily a disease or infection of animals. However, animal workers, particularly in rat-infested surroundings, um, will be more at risk of getting leptospirosis. Yung mga nasa, nasa slaughterhouse, yan. So, there's a chance talaga that they would really um, have high risk factor for leptospirosis, leptospirosis because dogs, rats, and other rodents are considered to be as the principal host and the bacteria are actually being excreted in the urine. So aside from that, even freshwater recreational exposure that has been contaminated um, by urine can also be a risk factor because bacteria in this contaminated water can survive for months in water. So even yung mga flood water, matagal na yung mga bacteria na nandyan, so mas napupunta lang sa tao as we wade into the flood water. So infection is enter, enters by contact with infected urine. Cases are likely unrecognized nationwide and would, could even go unreported. Okay, so pero usually napapansin ng mga healthcare workers natin, yung mga epidemiologists natin, that whenever there is flood, there is also high incidence of leptospirosis. So for specimen collection, if CNS is already involved, okay, um, we can collect CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. We can even collect blood toward the end of the first week of illness. However, after the first week of illness, urine will yield higher results. Um, direct microscopic examination is not recommended because the organisms are very thin and they're small. So optical recovery occurs if fresh specimens are inoculated directly into the laboratory media. So, kailangan natin i-culture yung leptospirosis. So, even if direct microscopic examination is not recommended, we can still examine the organisms from the culture media, either using the special stain or in this case, we are using a dark field microscopy. Okay? Face contrast is not recommended okay so we do not recommend direct microscopic examination from the urine because of the possibility of false positive results because of the presence of artifacts so it is only successful in small percentage of cases so it's very ideal that we do examination from the culture not from the specimen and speaking of culture we can have direct inoculation of one to two drops of fresh patient sample, either blood or CSF, into the culture medium, such as the Fletcher, the Stewart, and the EMJH medium. So we incubate the media in the dark at room temperature. Dilution of urine should be used to minimize effects of inhibitory substances. So weekly, we examine the tube for the presence of turbidity. 
and a drop is taken from a few millimeters below the surface. Ito yun. Um, few millimeters below the surface. Dito. Dito tayo kukuha sa Dinger's Ring. Okay? Kasi ito yung few millimeters from the surface. Okay? So that we can determine by means of dark field microscopy if spirochetes are present or not. Okay, so with that, we can also identify microscopic agglutination test. Dito sa microscopic agglutination test, um, um, this is actually using uh, the patient sample and we will determine if the patient's antibody can agglutinate the bacteria. Okay, and uh, these are, this one, 16S DNA, this one is a genotypic characterization. Pag sinabi natin genotypic characterization, uh, we are referring to molecular typing na. And then the serologic test uh, will involve IgM, ELISA, and macroscopic slide agglutination test. Okay? So, these are these are the um, serological tests. No? So, in serological tests, um, we are trying to determine antibodies. Kaya nga, ang tawag sa test na to is Leptospira Antibody Testing. So usually, kapag IgM yung at detected, we are referring to acute infection. Okay, pag IgM yung na-detect. Um, Antimicrobial susceptibility testing is typically not performed in the clinical laboratory. So, however, organisms, other organisms um, can be susceptible. So, these organisms include um, streptomycin, tetracycline, doxycycline, macrolides, and penicillin. Okay, so these are the organisms um, that may be involved in the infection. So they show some limited effectiveness if used early before the fourth day of illness. So dapat pala merong proper timing in the administration of the antibiotics. So there should be proper timing in the administration of the antibiotics for leptospira. Okay, so we're now discussing um, the second genus and this time. Um, let us discuss Borrelia. Okay, so the Borrelia. Okay, so Borrelia contain general species. So they are morphologically similar, para pareho yung tura nila, but have different pathogenic properties and host ranges. Okay, so therefore, um, kailangan um yung two main species lang yung i discuss natin. So so, yung first species um, can actually cause relapsing fever. Yung nagkakos ng relapsing fever is mostly Borrelia recurrentis. Okay? And most strains can cause relapsing fever. But the one that we will be studying for today is Borrelia recurrentis. Okay? All strains may cause relapsing fever except for Borrelia Burgdorferi. Because Borrelia burgdorferi is the causative agent of the Lyme disease or Lyme borreliosis. That's the other name for the Lyme disease. Okay? So the other name for the Lyme disease is Lyme borreliosis. So all pathogenic species are arthropod born. born. Okay? So the organism is a flexible organism. So they are helical bacteria that can grow as long as 20 microns in length. And they can be as wide as 0.5 microns in width. So they are actually spiral organisms. They are less tightly coiled than leptospira. Kasi in one organisms, there could only be between 3 to 10. 
coil per organism. So kung babalikan natin yung first picture dito, sa so umpisang umpisa, ayan, kita ninyo, Borrelia is tightly coiled. Pinaka-tightly coiled ang Borrelia. And then, eto, loosely coiled lang siya. In between is yung treponema. So, pinaka-tightly coiled yung leptospira. Okay, loosely coiled yung Borrelia. And in between Borrelia and leptospira is yung treponema. Okay, so the organism can be stained easily and can be visualized by bright field microscope. So usually, ginagamit natin ng blood smear. So sa blood smear, makikita natin yung organisms. Or electron microscopy can also be used. So this is an example of an electron microscope of Borrelia. Yeah, so this is the Borrelia in the blood smear. So sabi, 3 to 10 coil. Bilangin nga natin. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So tama. 10 coils. Okay. So yun yung tura ng Borrelia as seen under the uh, microscope. So eto, under lang to ng oil immersion objective. And this is 1,000 times. So sa blood smear. So pwede palang gamitin ng blood smear in order for us to observe Borrelia. Okay, so Borrelia recurrentis and other Borrelia would have virulence factors, particularly those that can cause relapsing fever. So they can evade complement by acquiring and, di and display displaying suppressive complement regulators. Complement kasi is a serum protein. Tayo ang nagpo-produce nito and it is actually our natural immunity. Mapag-aaralan natin sa immunology that a complement can lyse bacteria. However, um, they can produce complement regulators. Okay, yung CB4, BP, and factor H. Ito kasi makikita to sa alternative pathway ng complement. We can actually see these proteins in active in in alternative pathway. So they can regulate this complement. Kapag na-regulate nila yung complement, then the complement will no longer be effective against Borrelia. So the regulatory the suppressive complement regulators therefore is an example of a virulence factor. Okay, so relapses are caused by antigenic variation. Ano ba yung ibig sabihin ng relapses? So pag sinabi natin relapses, um, the fever will go up and down. So pwede kang magkaroon ng fever, pwede mawala. Okay, the specific antibodies are rendered ineffective in complete clearing the organism. So kahit na mag-produce pala tayo ng antibodies against Borrelia recurrentis, ineffective pa rin siya. So take a look at this particular example. Ito. So the patient was beaten by a tick. So nakagat siya ng, ng uh, antique sa Tagalog ay garapata. Nakagat siya ng garapata. After two weeks, tumaas bigla yung kanyang temperature. Pero before that, nakakaramdam na siya ng fever, headache, and myalgia. Okay? Tapos, um, ay hindi pala, sorry. Upon tick bite pala, this one pala is PCR. Upon tick bite, ang taas na ng temperature niya. Almost 40 na. Tapos, after mga nine days, biglang mawawala na yung fever. Babagsak na, magiging 36.5 na ulit. Pero, after 14 days, biglang tataas ulit yung fever. So, mga hospitalized na siya. Tapos, after 21 days, or even anong day ito, 
mga 25 days, mawawala ulit yung fever. Okay, so, ayun pala yung kaya pa siya tinawag na, kaya siya tinawag na, ano, na recurrent. Okay, recurrent fever. Kasi on and off yung fever ng patient. Okay, on and off yung fever ng patient sa, ano, sa Borrelia recurrence. Okay, so, symptoms of relapsing fever would include, um, Fever, headache, joint pain, loss of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. So the incubation period is 2 to 15 days. Ito yung relapsing fever. Um, there is a massive spirochetinia. Anong ibig sabihin ng spirochetinia? So when we say spirochetinia, it means that spirochetes, spirochetes are present in the blood. Okay, and it remains high all throughout the current infection. So, sudden symptoms will include, ito nga, high temperature, rigor, severe headache, muscle pain, and weakness. So, febrile period would last about for three to seven days, tapos mawawala, and then biglang magkakaroon ulit. Okay? Okay. So, Borrelia recurrentis and other similar Borrelia. So, ano lang, kaya siya tinawag na ano, Borrelia, ano, uh, relapsing fever kasi nga mawawala yung fever, uh, alis, tapos magbabalik, tapos at yon, parang ano, ano yung kantang nobela, parang ganoon. At uh, alis, magbabalik. Let's chat ko na lang. Okay. So, Borrelia recurrentis. So, yung Borrelia recurrentis, um, disease recurs several days to weeks. Yun nga, at aalis, magbabalik, at muling sasaktan. So, parang gano'n, no? paulit-ulit yung fever. Kala mo, mawawala na, tapos babalik ulit. So, pero, pagbalik ng fever, less severe na, but with similar course. Um, the febrile period, pag sinabi natin febrile period, ito yung period of meron kayong fever. Worse and during spirochetinia. So the more spirochetes in the blood, the more mas mataas yung temperature niyo, and wanes as the immune response clears the bacteria from the circulation. So kailangan yung immune system natin should be able to fight Borrelia para yung yung ano natin makarecover yung immune system natin and then manumbalik sa normal yung temperature. Okay, so there are two varieties of of relapsing fever at dalawa pala no you can be beaten by a tick pwede kayong makagat ng garapata or you can be beaten by the louse pag sinabi nating louse um ito yung ano kuto so if it's a tick born it's called endemic relapsing fever okay it is actually um due to the transmitted by a bite of soft ticks of genus Ornithodorus. Ayan. So, bakit siya endemic? Diba pag sinabi nating endemic, it means that the disease is constantly present in the, in a certain place. So, laging merong um, recurrent sa lugar na yon, kasi nga, nandun yung mga ticks, nandun yung mga garapata. Okay. Yung louse born naman is epidemic. Okay. So, di ba, pag sinabi natin epidemic, epidemic means that the disease is easily transmitted within the population. So, if the disease is easily transmitted within the population, why? Because laos can easily transfer from one head to another. Okay. So, it is transmitted by crush or scratch into the skin of the body laos. Meaning to say, this laos doesn't have to bite you. So, kapag tiniris ninyo yung mga puto, 
Okay? If you're going to crush this louse in your scalp or in your skin in cases of body louse, the fecal material of this body louse contains Borrelia. And this particular Borrelia would even infect okay, the human. So humans are the only reservoir okay, of the louse born. So, nyo rito, humans are the only reservoir. Whereas the tick born, pigs and chickens, birds, rodents, and bats could be a possible reservoir. Okay, so pigs and chicken for Borrelia dotoni. Okay, birds for Borrelia hermsi, and for other species of Borrelia such as Rocidure, Turicate, Hispanica, and Persica. So they can be transmitted by the ticks from the rodents and from the bats. Okay, so let's talk about uh, microscopic examination and culture. So for microscopic examination, we can examine the blood smear. Just like your malaria, if you, if you can still remember malaria, you can even perform the thick and thin film. Okay, so we usually use bright field microscope. Okay, bright field microscopy for spirochetes commonly seen among the red cells. Okay. For culture, uh, we should be able to use the Kelly medium. So in Kelly medium, um, animal inoculation is very rare and serology is difficult in, and impractical. So mas maganda at the height of the fever, we collect the blood and examine the blood smear and look for the presence of Borrelia. Although we cannot identify the species by just looking at the blood smear. But at least we could say that the patient is positive for Borrelia. Okay, one of the reasons why people do not want to drink antibiotics is because of the side effects of drinking the antibiotics. So the name of that side effects is characterized by, is known as the Jarich Herxheimer reaction. Okay. Um, it is the Jerich's Herxheimer reaction is when a person drinks antibiotics such as tetracycline, and then death of spirochetes can cause endotoxin release, and our body would be reacting to that endotoxin, and that reaction is known as the Jerich's Herxheimer reaction. The Jerich's Herxheimer reaction is characterized by fever, chills, headache, and myalgia. Okay? So, Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato, okay, is spread, okay, bacterial spread, okay? So, paano ba nagkakaroon ng virulence factor? Primarily because they bind with plasminogen. Ano ba yung plasminogen? Plasminogen, Sa HIMA, mapag-aaralan ninyo to, plasminogen is the precursor of plasmin. Plasmin is the protein that can lyse fibrin clot. Urokinase is another type of uh, enzyme that would also have the same action. Okay? Therefore, Therefore, um, because of that, they could act as a protease to promote tissue invasion. So, for example, mayro mga harang hindi makapasok ang ang mga Borrelia because of they bind with plasminogen. This particular clot will now be dissolved, and this will result to tissue invasion tissue invasion. Okay, so that's one. And Borrelia can also bind with factor H. Okay, so factor H is an example of complement 
protein. So organisms can also stimulate pro-inflammatory cytokines. So once the pro-inflammatory cytokines are produced, necrosis factor and interferons may be of significance, particularly in untreated infection. So yung mga necrosis factors and interferons, uh, our body uh, will have exaggerated reaction towards the bacteria. Kaya magkakaroon ng cytokine storm because of the stimulation caused by Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. Okay? So, by the way, ha, Borrelia burgdorferi na yung pinag-uusapan natin. Hindi na Borrelia recurrentis. Because Borrelia burgdorferi here is the causative agent of Lyme disease. Okay. So, Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme disease is complex because it is made up of three stages. So the early infection has two stage, two stages, and the late infection is consisting only of one stage. So the one that you can see here is stage one. Okay, so about 60% of the patients would develop erythema migrans, or sometimes it is known as the E. ECM ECM stands for erythema chronicum migrans. So it is characterized by the presence of red macule. Ito, this is the original red macule and it expands to form larger annular erythema target that appears like a target. So para nagkakaroon ng bull's eye appearance. So it is as if that we're looking at the bull's eye appearance because of the large annular erythema target appearance. Okay, so that is for Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay, so that is stage number one. Now, stage number two is characterized by early disseminated stage, which produces widely variable symptoms. So aside from the ECM, so there is now a secondary skin lesions, migratory, migratory joint and bone pain, alarming neurologic and cardiac pathology. Alarming kasi it involves now the brain and the heart, splenomegaly, severe malay, and fatigue. Now stage three is characterized by late persistent infections. So cardiac, musculoskeletal, and neurologic involvement. Now, in stage number three, arthritis is a common symptom which occurs weeks to even years later. In fact, yung tinatawag na juvenile arthritis okay, is even possible for Borrelia burgdorferi infection. So it's even common or even possible for Borrelia burgdorferi infection. So organisms are transmitted via the bite of exodus tick, which means unlike, unlike um, Borrelia recurrentis, Borrelia recurrentis is caused by Ornithodorus tick. This time, Borrelia burgdorferi is caused by exodus. And these are the stages of development of the exodus tick. So this is the larvae, this is the nymph, this is the male, and a larger one is the female. So Borrelia burgdorferi stricto is common in North America and Europe. So usually in temperate countries. Borrelia garini and Avzeli and garini as well occurs in Asia and in Europe. So in order for us not to get infected with Lyme disease, we have to have a protective clothing, repellents, and we have to remove the attached tick. So do not allow yourself to be beaten by ticks. A. So most common and productive sample is serum for serology. Okay, so we can do the serological test. 
for Borrelia recurrentis, serology is not advisable. But for Borrelia burgdorferi simsulato, okay, serological test is actually advisable. So other tests may have too many limitations or have not been adequately validated. So at the early stages in, in, in serological tests or Borrelia antibody testing, uh, we can have high level of IgM, but at the late stages after the tick bite, years after, uh, we can get the IgG. So large plasma cultures have been shown to be positive in about 50% of adult patients with erythema migrans. So if a person has erythema migrans, erythema migrans, then 50% chance of getting a positive culture. So there's a 50% chance of getting a positive culture. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato. Okay, serological test. So aside from the antibody testing, uh, I mean, aside from the, uh, there are actually several methods of antibody testing. So step one is a screening test a sensitive screening test. So a sensitive screening test can either use an indirect nourishment assay or enzyme immunoassay, but a more practical way of doing that is through the rapid enzyme immunoassay because as a rapid enzyme immunoassay, it's much easier to have a result. So all you have to do is to add serum. You don't need to use um, organisms because in indirect nourishment assay, you have to use a test organism. Though, indirect fluorescent assay is much visually beautiful because you'll be able to see organisms that glow in the dark and this serves as a positive reaction. Okay, step two is the confirmation test. So, for the confirmation test, for the confirmation test, um, you determine the presence of IgM or IgG depending on whether the symptoms were present for longer for longer than 30 days. Kasi kapag more than 30 days na, wala na yung IgM. So most likely, IgG na lang yung madetetect ninyo. So Western blood confirmation of IgM antibody present is considered to be as a confirmatory test. So it is being performed when step 1 yields positive or equivocal result. So mag-step 2 lang tayo kapag positive yung step 1. So, the purpose of step two is for confirmation. So it's a, actually a confirmatory test. So this is an example of a Western blot. So again, when you say Western blot, Western blot is also known as the protein probe. So for Borrelia burgdorferi Western blot, we're trying to determine the presence of antibodies against Borrelia burgdorferi marker proteins. In this case, the marker proteins that we will be using are the OSP, OSPC, OSPA, and the flagellin. If we produce IgG, if we produce um, anti-IgG against flagellin, OSPA, and OSPC, then we are considered to be as positive. But the requirement is two to three of the IgM bands. Okay, so what are the markers for the IgM bands? OSP, OSPA, OSPC, and flagellin. Okay, that is for the IgM band. However, after one month, after 30 days, we will not be seeing IgM bands anymore, but we will be seeing IgG bands. And there are 10 IgG bonds depending on the 
kilodaltons. So you can have the protein 18, protein 21, protein 28, protein 30, protein 39, 41, 45, 58, 66, 93. You have to be positive 5 out of 10. Okay. So this is useful even after 30 days. So if serology is negative, but the symptoms are consistent with Lyme disease, lalong lalo na kapag meron namang ECM, a convalescent serum should be obtained and tested. Anong ibig sabihin ng convalescent serum? Convalescent serum means yung serum na magaling na yung patient. Okay? It should be it should be obtained and tested. Okay? So, this is the Western blot. So, again, pag sinabi natin Western blot, it is the protein probe. Why protein probe? Because we determine the presence of antibodies against Borrelia, burgdorferi furry marker proteins. For IgM, there are three marker proteins. For IgG, there are 10 marker proteins. For antimicrobial susceptibility testing, early diagnosis and treatment are important for preventing it. So, neurologic, cardiac, and joint abnormalities that occur late in disease. So, you have to, you have to be um, very careful on it, okay? So, kailangan ma-prevent natin yung neurologic cardiac because it's almost always too late kapag nag-show na ng neurologic or cardiac because it means nasa stage 2 and 3 na yung patient. So, dapat sa stage 1 pa lang, mabigyan na kaagad ng treatment. So, stage 1 of Lyme disease without complications, ibig sabihin, wala pa yung neurologic and cardiac, then macrolides, doxycycline, and amoxicillin are typically effective. Kapag nasa late stage na, then ceftriaxone is actually being given. So antimicrobial susceptibility testing is not being warranted for Borrelia burgdorferi. So kailangan alam, the doctor should know at what stage are you in. So it's very important that the doctor should be getting the clinical history of the patient. Okay, so we're now on our last topic for the spirochetes. Okay, so the last topic for the spirochetes are the treponemes. So they are thin spiral organism. So as what I've shown you, it's the, the, the characteristic coil of treponemes are somewhere in between Borrelia and Leptospire. So very thin lang. Kasi di ba yung, yung Borrelia can be as thick as 5 microns. Ito, yung thickness niya is 0.2 microns. Yung Borrelia, 0.5 microns. Okay? So, but it can reach up to 20 microns in length. It is difficult to visualize with bright field microscope. So, that's why we use a dark field microscope or we can even use a gold stain. Um... Yung Fontana Tribute 2 Steam and the Silver Leva Dietis Steam. So that's the one that we're using for treponemes. Okay. So there are the spirals are irregular and angular with 4 to 14 spirals per organism, so 4 to 14 spirals. Three periplastic flagella are inserted into each end of the cell. So ends are pointed and covered with a sheet. So whenever they are, whenever they are in a liquid medium, they would exhibit a graceful flexus movements in liquid media. So that's how they move, no? the treponin. Okay. 
So this is an example of the scanning electron micrograph of the treponema pallidum. And these are the different clinically important species of treponema. Okay, so treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum is the causative agent of syphilis. Treponema pallidum subspecies per tenu is the causative agent of Yaus. Treponema pallidum subspecies endemicum is the causative agent of endemic syphilis. Treponema pallidum subspecies carasium is the causative agent of Pinta. So we will try to discuss them one by one. So let's discuss first the subspecies pallidum. Okay. Treponema pallidum is sometimes known as the sneaky spirochetes because they can penetrate even an intact mucous membrane. Ang leptos, ang leptos, <clears throat> ang leptospira, leptospira can only enter our body by means of an open wound. But for Treponema pallidum subspecies pallidum, they can enter our body by means of an intact mucous membrane. Okay? So that is the reason why they are known as the sneaky spirochetes. They can even cross the placenta and disseminate all throughout the body and organ system. So there is also an antigenic variation of cell surface proteins. And this may help them evade host immune system and even establish persistent infection. Well, what does it mean? These particular organisms can actually can actually find a way to sneak around our immune system. Okay, so the transmission is caused by sexual contact. So it says here, even if you wear a condom. This will not protect you from getting syphilis because the condom will just cover the penis. But the other parts of the peri of the genitalia, the other part of the areas surrounding the genitalia is not covered by condom. So how do you get the infection? By by skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact with the ulcer and that ulcer is known as the chancre or canker so if there's if there's a if there's a skin to skin contact even if you are wearing a condom um this will actually this will actually um this will actually uh lead to syphilis however wearing condom is better than not wearing anything at all in preventing the infection. But the one that is best is not to have unprotected sex with unmarried partner. So that's the best way of preventing the infection. Okay, so chunker is the ulceration, okay, of the syphilis. So once the organisms enter, so it can enter via mucous membrane, it can enter via cuts, abrasion, and directly through intact mucous membrane. And it can enter other sites such as the lips or transplacentally. Kaya nga, these are the risk, the predisposing factors, no? Unprotected sex. Multiple partners. Men having sex with men. Mother-to-child transmission. And HIV positive. These are the risk factors for getting syphilis okay and you are also the chances of you getting hiv is also high if you have shanker because you already have an open wound and the virus can easily uh it will actually it, it is as if that you're adding an additional portal of entry for the hiv so this is an example of a shanker in the penis so it says here Syphilis is a co-infection with HIV and can result in variation of the natural 
cause course of the disease. Kasi nga, the ulcer here, okay, caused by syphilis may contribute to the efficiency of HIV transmission in populations with high rates of both infections. So, it is considered to be as the great imitator of a wide variety of clinical manifestations. So, later on, makikita natin that there are several stages of syphilis and the clinical infection manifestation may imitate other clinical infection. So, for example, Haemophilus ducreyi is also characterized by the chancre. Ang difference nga lang, this particular chancre is painless. Unlike the chancre of Haemophilus ducreyi. So, the primary stage of syphilis is the presence of chancre. Okay, so that's the primary stage. Usually one, but sometimes there are several, particularly in HIV patients. Okay, so it, it could reach up to 10 to 90 days after the infection. So that's the incubation period. So it's actually a result of inflammatory response to infection at the site of inoculation. So yung chancre pala is a manifestation that treponema pallidum has entered our body. So it is characterized by erythematous lesion. So non-tender but firm. Clean surface raised border in women. It is found in cervix or vaginal wall. So it may not be obvious. It is hidden in women. But it can also be found in anal canal. In men, it is also found in penis or in anal canal. So depending on the sexual activity. And it can also be found in the oral cavity. If the men is involved, or if both men or women are involved in fellatio. So there's no system systemic signs or symptoms. Okay? Are no systemic signs or symptoms are evident at the primary stage of syphilis. So this is an example of the chancre in the mouth. Um, this is the example of chancre in the in the women's um, vaginal opening, um, chancre in the anus. Ay, ito pala is ano, this, this one pala is the penis, this one is the mouth. Okay, so that is the primary stage of syphilis. Now, the secondary stage of syphilis begins two to 12 weeks after the chancre appearance. So it is characterized by secondary diseases possible with clinical symptoms. So aside from, from the lesions that you can see, uh, it is also characterized, not lesions, but rashes. It is characterized by fever, sore throat, generalized lymph adenopathy, headache, lesions of the mucous membrane. So there is a rash, so macular and papular rash, follicular, papulus famous, or pustular can occur in the palm and in the soles of the foot, of the feet, sa so, talampakan, the palad, and all throughout the body. So these are where the rashes can be seen in the secondary stages of syphilis. And then the secondary stage of syphilis is also characterized by condylomata, condylomata lata. Okay? It is a moist, gray, white flakes teeming with spirochetes. So, para siyang wart like lesion. So, this is a condylomata lata in the anus of a man who was involved in anal sex, unprotected anal sex. So here, it is teeming with spirochetes. So maraming spirochetes yan. And since it is teeming with spirochetes, um, these are highly infectious. It may, go be, it may also be mild and go unnoticed by the patient. Okay? So still, this part of the 
secondary stage of syphilis. Then after the secondary stage, um, we now have the um, latent stage. So after the secondary stage heals, the individuals are not anymore contagious. So relapses of secondary syphilis occurs in 25% of untreated. Ibig sabihin, pwedeng bumalik on secondary if you're not treating it. So at the latent stage, the clinical manifestations are absent. So latency occurs within one year of infection, and that's the early latency. The late latent stage occurs after one year of infection. So what does it mean? At the latent stage of the syphilis, the patient becomes asymptomatic, non-infectious, but positive, still positive in serological tests. So even if they are asymptomatic and non-infectious, the patients remain to be positive in serological test. After the Latin stage, we now have the tertiary stage of syphilis. So this is now the fourth stage. One third of untreated patients exhibit a biological cure losing serologic activity. So these are fortunate patients because they have exhibit biological cure. However, Another one third remains latent for life, but have reactive serology. What does it mean? In serological tests, even if they are asymptomatic, they remain to be positive in serological tests, which means they can don they cannot donate blood, because they remain to be positive. The the severe one third develops into a tertiary even 10 years after. And this, this unlucky one-third is characterized by the presence of gamma. And here's an example of gamma. You will have a lifelong deform physical deformity. So this is for the unlucky one-third. Even 10 years after the initial infection, um, they could still develop gamma. Okay, a disfigurement, physical um, disfigurement. Okay, so the symptoms is development of granulomatous lesion in the skin, known as gammas. Not just in the skin, the bone can also be affected. Okay, the liver can also be affected. So that's what you call the benign. Um, tertiary syphilis. But in some cases, the organisms may even go to your CNS. Okay? So, nagkakaroon na ngayon ng neurosyphilis. Okay? So, in neurosyphilis, there is now a degenerative lesion. So, pwedeng magkaroon ng tabes dorsalis. And this can actually result to paralysis. Katulad nito. Okay, ito naman, yung skull na sira. Ito yung lesion sa meninges in neurosyphilis. Okay? If, if the heart is affected, there is now a cardiovascular lesion. So possible complications will include aortitis, aortitis, I'm sorry for that, aneurysm, aortic valve insufficiency. So this is the cardiac syphilis. Okay. So, however, there are some person who develop the asymptomatic CNS disease. 
So CSF abnormalities without symptoms. But it is characterized by pleocytosis. So when you say pleocytosis, it is the high WBC count in the CSF. So the term pleocytosis is also known as the high WBC count. So this is a CSF specimen and you'll be able to see many WBC count. So that is pleocytosis, elevated protein levels, but decreased glucose level. So here, patients are not usually infectious, and it is not often seen in areas where patients are adequately treated before this stage is reached. So if you do not want to go in, even into the secondary, if you do not want to go to the tertiary stage, then patients should be adequately treated. These are the unlucky children, okay, the congenital syphilis. This child is born from a mother who has been infected with syphilis. So it affects many body system and as such is severe and mutilating. So the mutilating disease of congenital syphilis is called stigmata. So there's a chance that a person, when he grows adult, as an adult, or kahit na two years pa lang siya, it still resembles syphilis in adults. Kasi um, the child will develop mucocutaneous vision, osteochondritis, anemia, hepatosplenomegaly, and CNS involvements. So it occurs when mothers have early syphilis during pregnancy. So dapat pala, we are screening the mother for any of the sexually transmitted infection. So the children will not have this kind of infection. Okay, so the late onset congenital syphilis, so tertiary syphilis, corresponds to the tertiary syphilis in adults. So it occurs following pregnancies when mothers have chronic untreated infection. So symptoms occur after two years of age but are generally not apparent until the second decade of life. So 20 years old na yung bata, so, para, so mas magiging apparent na siya. So it is characterized by interstitial keratitis. So the child could be blind. Bone and tooth deformities. Eight nerve deafness, neurosyphilis, and other tertiary manifestation. So as you can see, this particular child has congenital syphilis. So th there is a destruction of nasal bones with major portion of skin and nose and its vicinity. The skin is replaced by cicatricial tissue. Ectropion of the lower lid, lowing, uh, owing to the contraction of the scar. Kita nyo. The scar themselves are affected by recent ulceration. So, nagkaroon ng two years old pa lang yung batang ito. So, nakakaawa, no? If a child is born from a mother with a chronic syphilis. So, it is as if the child is paying the price in which the price of the crime in which he is innocent of. So, yun yung repercussion of having a congenital syphilis. So, let's talk about specimen handling. So, the transmission is direct contact. Okay, direct injection, direct contact with lesions, and transplacental transmission. Aside from that, it can also be transmitted by blood transfusion. Huh? So take note that we have to screen donors for syphilis because the infection can still be transmitted by blood transfusion, though there are studies that says that syphilis cannot is not viable if stored for three days. 
The treponema pallidum is not viable if stored for three days at room temperature. So they are actually not viable. Okay. So specimen collection, uh, the primary or secondary lesion, so this is an example of a primary lesion, is cleaned with saline and gently abraded with dry sterile gross. And then, so may mga serous fluid done. So we place the serous fluid to slide with saline. We cover it with a cover slit and observe it under a dark field microscope. Okay? But usually, so this is an example of direct microscopic examination okay so usually use serology or direct examination so we do not use oral lesion because of the non-pathogenic oral flora ang ginagamit lang natin is yung primary lesion coming from the genitalia Um, the Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum, microscopic examinations. So what you can see here are the organisms are too thin for bright field microscopy. So that's why we have to use a dark background. And it requires considerable skill and experience. So the presence of motile treponemes in materials from the shanker is diagnostic for primary syphilis. So pag meron kayo nakita na, na gumagalaw na organisms, corkscrew motility. Okay, so it means that the organism is positive, I mean that the patient is positive for primary for primary syphilis. Okay, serological test is actually more practical. Actually, bibihira yung lab na, na gumagamit ng direct microscopic examination. So the, the serological test is divided into two major tests. No? So we have the treponemal test. Treponemal test uses treponema pallidum as an antigen. So yung example nito is yung FTA, ABS, EPI, MHA, TP, TPCF. Okay. Ang FTA ABS stands for fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption. TPI stands for treponema pallidum immobilization. Ito used to be the reference test, but it's not being done anymore. Kasi nga, it requires you to use a live treponema pallidum. MHATP stands for microhemagglutination treponema pallidum. And TPCF stands for treponema pallidum complement fixation. So these are examples of treponemal test. So treponemal test is the confirmatory test already. So they are confirmatory tests. Okay. The non-treponemal test uses, yung non-treponemal test uses cardiolipin as antigen. Pag sinabi natin cardiolipin, cardiolipin is the beef heart extract. Okay. And, and, there are two types of non-treponemal tests. Okay, either we use the the VDRL and the other one is the RPR. VDRL stands for Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. So that is VDRL, Venereal Disease Research Laboratory, and the other one is RPR which stands for rapid plasma reagent. 
So RPR stands for rapid plasma reaging. So both tests have lower sensitivities in the primary stage, but approach 100% in the secondary stage of CPD. So mas maganda pala kapag nasa secondary. Why? Because it is during the secondary stage that antibodies for diagnosis are developed or are formed. So kasi sa primary stage, wala pa masyadong antibodies. But once you have reached the secondary stage, it is now the time that you are, are, are starting to form antibodies. Okay? So the tertiary syphilis has a very high sensitivity and it detects for specific... Okay? So let's discuss first the treponemal test. The treponemal test has high uh, sensitivity kasi nga, the treponemal test uses treponemal antigen. And it is also helpful in the detection of the late stage infection, but it is not useful in following therapy or detecting reinfection. So what are examples of treponemal tests? So this is um, TPPA, so formerly also known as MHATP, um, microhemagglutination treponema pallidum, or sometimes Treponema pallidum particulate agglutination. So it uses gelatin particles. So yung gelatin particles are sensitized with treponemal pallidum antigen. So please ha, uh, pakicorrect yung spelling dito. Agglutination indicates the presence of anti-treponemal antibody. So guys, tandaan niyo, if we are using treponemal test, the, the source of antigen is treponema pallidum. And we are detecting anti-treponemal antibodies. Enzyme immunoassay is easier to perform. So this is an example of the enzyme immunoassay. And this one is commercially available. So this one is the TPPA. And this one is the enzyme immunoassay. Another example of Another example of treponemal test is the FTA-ABS. This one is an example of treponemal test. So this one has a very high sensitivity, especially for detecting neurosyphilis. Because here, the specimen that we will be using is a CSF or a cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so let us discuss the non-treponemal test. So as what I told you, there are two types of non-treponemal test. So the first one is the VDRL, the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. So here, all we have to do is to mix the patient serum or CSF with the cardiolipin. So ano yung difference niya sa treponemal test? In treponemal test, we are using treponema pallidum itself as the source of antigen. But here in VDRL and in RPR, we are using cardiolipin. Okay? A positive reaction is this one. This is called flocculation. Okay? So flocculation is defined as a low-grade precipitation reaction. So flocculation is defined as a low-grade precipitation reaction and this can be read microscopically. Okay, so this can be read microscopically. Okay, so that is for treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. So this is a non-treponemal test. Okay, so the other one is the rapid plasma reagent. So this one is the RPR and it contains black carbon particles bound to cardiolipin and mixed with patient sera. So ang advantage, ang VDRL kasi, you need to heat 
the and you need to heat the serum at 56 degrees centigrade, centigrade for 30 minutes you call it inactivation and the purpose of inactivation is to destroy native complement okay now rpr is called rapid and the reason why rpr is called rapid because there's no need for heat inactivation meaning to say you don't have to heat the serum at 56 degrees for 30 minutes kaya mas mabilis siya and the reason why it's called rapid because here we are using charcoal or carbon particle as indicator and then this charcoal is actually absorbed with choline chloride and cardiolipin meaning to say we don't have to worry about the interference of the native complement so particles agglutinate thus it indicates a positive reaction or flocculation so this is reactive in rpr so nakikita nyo naman na nagkaroon na ng flocculation then this is non-reactive meaning to say there is no flocculation so here's another reaction of reactive in rpr ang advantage naman ng vdrl you can use CSF as specimen, meaning you can use this to detect neurosyphilis. Um, RPR, you cannot use this for CSF, meaning RPR or the rapid plasma reagent cannot be used to diagnose CSF because there are only two methods that we can use to diagnose neurosyphilis. One is VDRL. And the other one is the FTA APS. What's the difference? VDRL again is non treponeman, meaning to say cardiolipin ang antigen. FTA ABS is treponemal, meaning to say the treponema pallidum itself is used as an antigen. So VDRL has high specificity but low sensitivity. A negative test cannot rule out neurosyphilis. FTA ABS, on the other hand, has low specificity but high sensitivity. So a negative test, a negative test is a strong indicator against neurosyphilis. Okay, so other method is the rapid immunochromatographic test. So this one is another example of of a uh, treponemal test. Madali lang to, all you have to do is to add serum here. Tapos pag nag-double yung line, that's positive. Kapag isa lang yung line, that's negative. Ito is weakly positive kasi nga faint yung red. Ito invalid. Kasi wala yung control line. Okay? So, reactive sample needs a non-treponemal antigen follow-up. It utilizes recombinant treponema pallidum antigens to IgG and IgM. So, ibig sabihin, kapag meron kang antibodies, uh, you'll develop double line. So, it is an example of immunoblot assay. And it is useful in detecting sexually transmitted disease and antenatal clinics. Ibig sabihin, bago ipanganak yung na, mga anak yung nanay, kailangan mas screen muna if meron ba siyang syphilis or not. So this particular method can actually be utilized. Okay. So, what's the treatment for syphilis? Penicillin is long long acting penicillin is preferred. Particularly the benzatine penicillin which is delivered intramuscularly okay 
Dexocycline and tetracyclines can be used if the patient is allergic to penicillin allergies and if the patient is not pregnant. The problem is, again, the side effects. So I think I have already discussed with you the Jarex Hartzheimer reaction and exacerbation of cutaneous lesions can occur within hours after following treatment. So lalong lalabas yung mga rashes ng patient. Kasi nga, Treponema pallidum is dying and they are releasing endotoxin. Okay. So aside from treponema pallidum, we also have non-venereal treponemal diseases. So when you say non-venereal, it means it is not a sexually transmitted infection. So what are the examples of non-venereal treponemal diseases. Okay, so examples are R, Jos, Pinta, and endemic syphilis. So they occur in different geographic locations. So mostly in developing countries wherein the hygiene is poor, little clothing is worn, therefore kapag hindi masyadong nagdadamit yung mga tao, lalo na yung mga bata, direct skin contact is common because of overcrowding. So these diseases have primary and secondary stages, but the tertiary manifestations are uncommon. So they respond well to penicillin or tetracycline, and they are rarely transmitted by sexual contact. So congenital infections, unlike syphilis, congenital infections here do not occur. So here is an example of Yos. Okay, so yos is caused by, yaws or yos, caused by Treponema pallidum subspecies per 10 nu. So this one is found in Central Africa, South America, India, Indonesia, and other islands of the Pacific. So as you can see in the illustration, patients would develop chronic non-venereal disease that would have primary and secondary tertiary stages. So, yung mother yos, dito, yung mother yos, magproproduce ng mga daughter yos. Okay? Early stages, lesions are elevated, katulad dito, elevated granulomatous nodules. Okay, so that is yos. Okay, and then we also have the endemic syphilis. Um, Treponema pallidum endemicum, known as the Bejel syphilis. So this one is not sexually transmitted. It is found in Middle East and in desert regions. It is spread by direct contact or eating utensils. So it resembles yos. So the papules at first may go unnoticed, but it may progress to the gammas of the skin, bone, and nasopharynx. Okay, so that is the endemic syphilis or the vegel syphilis. And the last type of non-venereal disease or non-venereal treponemal disease is called pinta. Okay, so pinta is caused by treponema pallidum subspecies carasium. So it is found in the tropical regions of Central and South America. So it is spread by person-to-person -person contact, rarely by sexual relations. So lesions begin as scaling paintless papules followed by an erythromatous lesions that becomes hy hypo hypopigmented. So para mas namumuti siya in time. Okay? So that is Pinta. Okay, so that ends our discussion on treponema, on spirochetes.